So, uh, last week we asked the question, are there other gifts besides those mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12? Would you like me to read the passage in question? Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm going the wrong way. I thought that said 1 John. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse um, 4. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of, of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by, this, by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability uh, to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who approach, I'm sorry, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So, is this an exhaustive list? Is this all of the gifts or no? No? Why do you say no? Well, because I, I didn't hear the, the gifts of healing. I didn't hear the Oh, yeah, right here. Mm -hmm. um, in oh. verse uh, 9, uh, to another gifts of healing by, this, by the one spirit, to another the working of miracles. Oh, you read the whole thing already? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Boy, I must have snapped out. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. The, the wind has my head real foggy. I, I zoned out on like four different times. I was trying to read this book, and I was like, wait, what did I just read? Because <laughs> my head just feels thick from the wind. Um, well, I think the, how it says the gift of miracles, mm -hmm. I think that might have a wider variety. You know what I mean? Like, what do you mean? Like, it's not saying the miracle of um, producing more food, you know? Right, but I think it, it kind of is, is a, um, what do you say, blanket statement? Oh. Okay. Uh, miracles, you know? General. Yeah, in so gen general. Yeah, exactly, in yeah. general. Um, so are you saying you, you think this is not an exhaustive list, or you think it is an exhaustive list? Well... I can't say that I've seen other things other than that. Okay. Like, I, um, except for, like, maybe, um, where, uh, God tells a person what's going on in someone's life, and then they, you know, but I don't know where that would fall underneath. Wouldn't that be more like under knowledge? Maybe, I yeah. guess. Maybe yeah, so. Okay. So you're saying you're not necessarily for sure that this is a complete list, but you can't think of anything that's not on the list. Right. Okay. All right. Any other ideas? Or were you not done? No, I'm done. Okay. Uh, any other ideas? I couldn't really think of too much outside of this list either, but... Well, the snakes weren't in there. The snake uh, handling. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I didn't think it was really an exhaustive list just simply because a lot of things, when they're mentioned in lists, are not exhaustive. Mm. Yeah. There are other things that could apply to it. Mm. So. That's actually a good point. <clears throat> Were you going to say something? Yeah, I, I would say that it isn't really an exhaustive list, uh, list because anything can be used as a gift. Okay. In any, depending on the person. Like, what do you mean? Can you... I'm trying to think. My memory's still kind of out of it. Um, I can't think of really any examples right okay. now. Okay. Okay. Any other ideas? Keep thinking about that. Okay? And if you, if you come up with anything, just let me know. So...
let's kind of take apart some of this stuff. Um, let's read it again one more time. First Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit uh, the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability of, uh, to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So the first thing to notice is it's kind of odd how he... Um, the things that he chooses to list yeah. and how many he chooses to list. Yeah. But if you notice, he ends the list with two things, the tongues and the prophecy. Right. Well, tongues and, and interpretation, right. but those things go, go – he'll explain that later. Um, but then, and starting in verse 14, he specifically addresses those two things further, yeah. prophecy and tongues. So we'll look at that later, but I thought that was interesting, um, why he brought up these things and put it in this list, I mean in this order. So uh, we're going to look at a few things. Um, are these the only gifts? And the, the answer is kind of a little bit difficult, yes and no. Um, and I'll try to break it down in a simple way. But uh, I was talking to Pastor, and, and one thing that he said um, kind of got my attention. He said, I believe – this is him talking – I believe that, the, that this is a complete list of all the different things. And I think that's important to believe because if you don't, you start trying to add your other little things. And then he went on to mention a few of them that I'm sure you guys have heard him talk about before, the whole laughing thing. I'm laughing in the spirit. The whole snake handling thing. Yeah. You know, all these different things. And, and he is right. I mean if we start adding other things – Gold dust. Uh -huh. And I, I think one thing that's important is if there are other gifts. I, I have a really, really hard time personally saying something is definitive when it's about the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says in no uncertain terms about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So I make sure that there's absolutely no way that I'm, that I'm, that I'm you know, yeah. doing that. But however, with that being said, I kind of do see what he's saying. You know, and, and that, that, that definitely does happen. I don't really want to go too much into that, so I'm going to try and walk you through this. First off, he starts out with mentioning, mentioning the Holy Spirit and, and Jesus, and it appears as though the Father as well. You know, there are varieties of gifts, okay, but the same Spirit. That would be the Holy Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord, the same Jesus. Jesus is still over the same thing, right? Right. Um, and then in verse 6, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. So it seems like these are three different things that are pretty much the same. Vari uh, um, gifts and uh, service and uh, – where's the last one? And activities. It seems like these are just synony synonyms of the same um, of the same kind of thing, um, And he just, which kind of calls the, calls the question, why does he say this? And it seems like he's doing it to emphasize the supremacy of God in it. Remember last week we were talking about how you can't say it's all about Jesus because you can't really make that kind of a distinction in the Godhead? Remember we were talking about that? It seems like that's exactly what he's doing here. You can't make that kind of a distinction in the Godhead. So he's showing you it's not all about Jesus. It's not all about the Holy Spirit. It's not all about the Father. God worked to accomplish this thing. See, But then he does, does clarify very specifically that the Holy Spirit is the one who by whom the gifts are used through. Okay? And, and watch, he picks up in verse 7. Teach is given the manifestation of the Spirit. Okay, after he just said in verse 6, is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. Then he hops to verse 7 and he goes back to the Holy Spirit. Uh, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. Okay, but then he, he clarifies even further. Why is this given? What is the purpose of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit? For the common good. Exactly. So, what is a manifestation? Like a revealing, right? Something yeah. that happens. That right. Right. So like when God manifests his presence, he reveals it, right? Something that is actively 
revealing to people, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we know that it's it's the Holy Spirit who's doing this thing, and then it's done for for the common good. So that's the first thing to notice, because when you get into weird things, okay, just bear with me here. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. Now in the Greek, there's these two different words, um, a loss and a... Uh, Oh, what's that other word? I think it's uh, heteros. And these both mean other. Okay? But in classical Greek, before Koine Greek, right. it was used to distinguish uh, other of the same kind or other of a different kind. Like, for instance, hand me another apple would be, you know, I'm asking for another of the same kind. Mm -hmm. Or hand me another apple as in I have, a, I have an orange and I'm asking for a fruit. I'm asking I mean, an apple. I'm asking for a different kind. Okay, so in the Greek, why I say that is in the Greek, he says um, the utterance of wisdom and the utterance of knowledge are both use use the use the Greek word other of the same kind, which seems to imply that those two things are related. But then he uses the other Greek word heteros to go to the next group here, um, which is faith, healing, miracles, prophecy. And, and uh, distinguishing of spirits, and then he uses uses and on all those he used the same uh, Greek word of other of the same kind, right. which seems to imply that they're all together. Seems to imply, and then he uses that other word again, heteros, for other of a different kind, for the tongues and the interpretation, which seems to imply that there's three different groups here. The first group is um, uh, utterances of of knowledge and wisdom. And the last group is speaking in tongues and interpretation, and then the middle group is the uh, is the miracles, the prophecy, all all those things. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now I was reading, and Craig Blomberg uh, thinks that, that the reason is um, the the first thing and the, the first group and the last group are, are things that you um, um, are, are word things, spoken things, and then the things in the middle are service things. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not quite sure how that would affect with the prophecy being in that other group, yeah. but I guess it's somehow in between the two things, I guess. I'm not sure. Just thought I'd, I'd tell you guys about that. See what you guys, you know, as you read it, so keep that in mind. Um, okay, and then he goes to the end of this in verse 11. Um, All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Okay, so let's take that apart. All these are empowered by one of the same spirits, so the Holy Spirit is the one who's doing this, who apportions to each one, each of us, individually, okay, as he wills. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that kind of takes out the whole idea that it's our doing. It takes right. out the whole idea that it's um, we decide what spiritual gifts that we right. want. Yeah. Okay, yeah. takes out all that. Okay, so now that we've kind of looked at this, let's let's go back here. So are these the only gifts? Yes and no. Um, these are the only gifts, I believe, especially after talking with pastor, I fully believe this. These are the only gifts that are used in the church for enabling people to, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a church service. But as the Holy Spirit moves, he also accomplishes other things. We're going to look at this in a minute. But for instance, the Holy Spirit can empower us to a certain task. Like in Exodus chapter 31, where he, he uh, equipped Bezalel and Aholiab to do the work of building the temple, right? Right. Or tabernacle. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And it says very specifically, I have laid my spirit on them to do this task. Right. And then we, we also see that there's other things that happen when the Holy Spirit moves. We looked at last week the fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? That as the Holy Spirit works in us, there's evidences of him working. Right. But then there's other things of an encounter of the Holy Spirit. There's uh, the uh, speaking in tongues, which is different than the speaking in tongues. There is um, uh, being slain in the spirit. There is, uh, you know, uh, all all these all these other things. Uh, comfort, right. right? All these different things that happen through the Holy Spirit. But these are the these are separate from that. Okay, you have to see it as this: when the Holy Spirit moves, things happen. But the Holy Spirit only only moves people in a service according to to set standards. Okay, see what I mean? So he's not going to do something that's not coherent with this list. In other words, if he does do, if this is not an exhaustive list, let's just assume that it's not. I'm going to say it is, but let's just assume for this argument that it's not an exhaustive list. That there are other things. Those other things would have to be cohesive or um, agree with this list. 
Okay, so we can safely assume that the gold dust, would that be something that would conform to this list? Right. Yes or no? No? Why not? Well, it is, um, it's not something that would benefit the whole body. Yes. Anything else? Does it magnify God? Okay. Anything else? It just, it's, it's showy. Uh-huh. Yeah. Anything else? One thing that I think is kind of important is these things is the Holy Spirit equipping someone to serve someone else. Mm -hmm. Gold dust is not equipping a person to serve anyone. It's well, just, just gold there. dust. Yeah. Even when the Holy Spirit moves and there's the effects of him moving, like when he empowers someone to do a task, like gives them skill, or when someone's slain in the Spirit, or these other things, it's not like, oh, gold dust. You know, it's, it's, something, it's something tangible where the Holy Spirit is working in someone for a purpose. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And as somebody said, uh, it, God is glorified through the process. And that's foundational to these gifts here. Foundational. So if there were, hypothetically, if there were some other gifts out there, okay? I'm not talking about things that the Holy Spirit accomplishes in us. I'm talking about in the church setting, things that the Holy Spirit moves us to. For, see what I mean? Like that, okay? Um it would have to be something that would, that would match with this list. Right. So we can also safely rule out the laughing thing. Yeah. Because all that that does is gets the attention on us. Nobody is being, being encouraged by it. It's just weirding people out. Yeah. Okay? I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no profit to it. None of that. But it contradicts this list in another way because this list, and we'll look at this in just a second, says very specifically that the um, – can't remember the wording. Oh, no. That the spirit of a prophet is subject to the prophet. So if someone breaks out in holy laughter and they just can't control themselves, that's against the Holy Spirit because the Holy yeah. Spirit gives us an gives us a, a demeanor of, of self control. Uh -huh. Well, and another okay. thing is wow. it's more putting the spotlight from that person. Yes. That God. Yes, and then, exactly. There, there, there's no. Um, it's not really pointing to anything about God. Right. Prophecy points to something about God. Uh -huh. Words of knowledge points to something about God. Healing points to something about God. But there's absolutely nothing being accomplished in holy laughter. Holy urination we can we can write off too because first off, it's va it's vile nature. But if the vile nature isn't enough for you, you somehow forget everything the Old Testament law was based on. Right. Let's just say you do. Uh, <laughs> you still are left with the issue of how is this glorifying God? Uh -huh. How is not being able to control your bladder glorifying God? And the answer is it's not. So, then the snake handling, this is, we talked about this before, it, it's actually tempting God, because it's saying, look, yeah, exactly. God, you are going to bail me out of this situation that I'm putting myself in, yeah. and that's just how it is. Yeah. Does not sure it works like that. So, uh, the next thing, uh, there, uh, these are probably the only church gifts, I already mentioned that. Um, the Holy Spirit does cause other things as well, evidence for baptism, um, being slain in the Spirit, all these different things. Let's look at a few different things. I already mentioned Exodus 31, 6, so we're not going to turn there. But I do want to turn to 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, verses 8 through 11, which says this. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sin. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. In verse 10, check this out. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Verse 11, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So he's more talking generalities, and Paul was more talking in specifics. Okay, so that's the first thing to notice. Um, these things, the, the things that Paul mentioned can easily fit in these two categories of things that you're serving and things that you're speaking. Those, those, that other list can easily fit into this. But first Peter does, Peter does more of a blanket statement. And I think the reason why he does is because serving other people and loving other people isn't something that comes naturally. Right. That's something that comes as the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to. See what I mean? So is that a gift of the Spirit? No, not really. It's an empowerment of the Holy Spirit, yes, but it's not It's not really a gift of the Spirit. If you look at what Paul is talking about, he's talking about specifically this set list of things that Paul, I mean, that God uses as he's working in the congregation. And that's important because I believe my personal opinion 
that Paul was giving limitations to the Corinthians because they'd gotten so far out there with the weird stuff. Yeah. And so I think that Paul would want to give them a list of, okay, these are the kinds of things, okay? So once again, that's not necessarily saying that it is definitely an exhaustive list. Just something, you know, it, it seems that he's going into more of setting a standard. See what I mean? Either way, it seems like he's setting the standard. So anything else that's, that's outside of that list really needs to make sure that it is actually of the attitude of that list either way, right? Right. Okay. Um, I, I think <clears throat> really with like the serving people, it shows more instead of being a gift of the Holy Spirit, it shows that the Holy Spirit is working in us. Yeah. Because naturally we don't want to right. serve you. Naturally we're very me focused. Right. So. Me? <laughs> yeah, and actually that, I'm, I'm glad you said that because that goes right hand in hand with what we were talking about last week. Remember we were talking about the gifts of, I mean, the fruit of the Holy Spirit and how, how the evidence is the Holy Spirit moving and that kind of stuff. Remember that? I mean, we'll talk more about that this week, but I, I think that's that's right on. Um, so then there is something else that needs to be said because some people have, have made the statement, oh, that they're just they're just gifted with the Holy Spirit. Huh. And then other people have said, oh, they, they're just they just have that natural talent. And sometimes huh. both those things are wrong. Sometimes. Sometimes people do just have natural talents. Okay. And sometimes people are, are gifted by the Holy Spirit and they just don't use that. Okay, so I do want to give a little bit of balance here, and I'm going to try to do my best. First off, not everybody who has a skill is given that skill by, by the Holy Spirit. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Not everybody who has a skill is given that skill by the Holy Spirit. Some people are just talented. Some people are just talented. But then, there are some times when the Holy Spirit will equip somebody with a skill. Perfect example of this is me with the guitar. It does not make sense that anybody playing guitar, no matter how hard you practice, would be able to pick it up that fast and go to nationals and get on the top three. That doesn't make sense. It's not by my skill that that happened. I, I fully believe. I fully believe that God empowered me with that skill for a purpose. What was the purpose? So that I could go on to lead worship in churches. Uh -huh. See what I mean? He gave a skill for a reason to glorify his name. Yeah. See what I mean? And I, I fully believe there with my whole heart. Now, can just anybody pick up a guitar, practice every day, and do well? Yeah, I think oh, yeah. anybody can learn to play yeah. the guitar. But what, what the Holy Spirit did in me, I fully believe, was a supernatural thing. Right. See what I mean? I picked it up fast. The same year I started playing classical guitar, I went to nationals for classical guitar and got third place in the nation. That's yes. not something that people do. Oh. And I would like to say that I'm just a super talented person, but I've tried other, other instruments. I have. You should have seen me in my piano days. That was terrible. <laughs> terrible. Um, I've tried to get into stuff like flutes and that kind of stuff. That, that's nonsense. I don't know why, but the Holy Spirit just equipped, it, equipped me to, for a task. See what I mean? So I hope that, that makes sense. Now the second thing here. There are some things where people aren't necessarily gifted by the Holy Spirit, but they could still use their natural talent for the glory of God. Right. Does that make sense? Kind of? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, any questions on that? Because sometimes what people will do is they'll attribute something to the Holy Spirit that is not the Holy Spirit. Right. Okay. Like, I heard one guy talking about how ACDC was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, this what? is a good example of how this is complete and utter ridiculousness. What's ACDC? I've heard of uh, They're a rock, a rock band, band from, like, the 80s. I think they actually are still out around, I think. Yeah, they're short, still, they're still rock. Or something. ACDC. I think maybe the currents. <laughs> Alternative yeah. current. Direct current. Yeah. <laughs> they use it in electricity, but, but other than that, it's just no, a it's rock just band. A, I get, yeah, a rock band. Don't, 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 don't. It's not a good rock band. It's not. Okay, A. Let's talk about the content of their songs. Ugh. Okay, then B. If you can get past the content, you still have to hear, listen to the guy's voice. It's like, geez, guy, why don't you stop smoking for a second and see if maybe that clears up. Ugh. Anyways. Call ACDC. Music. I ought to throw If I could... You know what? Call me. Anyways. Back in the hippie days when people were stoned, they might have been good. <laughs> Anyways, um, and then, so we need to be careful about this, though. See what I mean? Because some, when the Holy Spirit equips us for something, we should by all means use that thing. Okay? But we shouldn't go to the extent of 
attributing something to the Holy Spirit that's not the Holy Spirit. Okay, and I would very highly caution you against this because that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing with Jesus yeah. when he specifically told them, this is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and that's not 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 forgiven ever. Like, in this life or the next, it's just not forgiven. So I'd be very, very, very careful about saying that something is or is not the Holy Spirit unless you're positive that it is or is not the Holy when Spirit. When in doubt. Yeah. <laughs> when in doubt, zip it. Now, there's some times that we're going to look at this. How do you know if, it, if it's the Holy Spirit, like, in, in prophecies and that kind of stuff? We'll look at that in just a second. But if it's something that's like, then just, yeah. it's okay to be quiet if, you don't, if you're not sure. It's okay. <laughs> it's better safe than sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so, any questions on this? Okay, so, like, Christians, okay, the Holy Spirit equips, with that, equips you with that gift. Uh -huh. How did the world go by? I mean, there's talented singers, you know, there's, you right. know, Players and now, see, this is where it gets complicated. <laughs> the Holy Spirit sometimes will equip non-Christian people mm -hmm. for a certain time or for a certain thing. Why? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes he just does things. I don't know. Whatever. But by and large, overall, that is not the uh, that is not a gifting of the Holy Spirit. See what I mean? Uh, or sometimes uh, the Holy so Spirit... it's just a, uh, a talent. God created you. Yeah, a natural talent. Yeah. Oh. Um, and that's why I was saying not every natural talent is by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people are just good at something. I'm great at video games. Woohoo! <laughs> natural talent there. <laughs> but that's not the Holy Spirit who gave me that talent. I just like playing video games. You see what I mean? <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but then there are some times when God does equip a non-Christian person for... I'll get it, Grace. You, you're holding it. Probably oh, somebody. I think it's just a Oh, okay. All right. So, any other questions? Okay. Now, remember, stop me if if you do have anything. Okay. Because if you have a question, you you never know. Maybe you maybe the answer is going to benefit everybody, not just yourself. So, good thing to keep in mind. Um, how do you know it's God? Okay. <laughs> this is a huge question, and I will do my best to answer it in a timely manner. First off, we're going to go to 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Now, I said about being careful about attributing something to the Holy Spirit, but I do want to also give another side of that. How do I want to say this? As Christians, we need to be discerning, and we need to judge the things that are happening in the church. Do you understand? Yeah. If there are things that are out of order and are unbiblical, they need to be addressed. Okay? All right? Now, with that being said, sometimes people will go a little bit off when they're giving a word. And when that happens, it doesn't need to be addressed every time. Okay? Because people make mistakes. You just need to throw out the part that was obviously not the Holy Spirit and listen to the other part. How do you know that, whether it's the Holy Spirit? Okay. Matches up with the word. Up with the word. We're going to look at this, but just bear with me, okay? So 1 John chapter 4, 1 through 3. And like I say, I'm really trying to say a lot of different things, and I'm trying to hit it at 20 different angles, and so if you have a question, please right. do ask, because uh, I'm trying to make this easy to understand, not hard. Uh, chapter 4 picks up like this. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come to, in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. So the first thing here is the Holy Spirit will equip people and guide people and, and use them in a way that validates the ministry of Jesus. Okay, It's going to be something that points to God. It's going to be something that validates what the rest of the Bible says. It's not going to be something that goes against the character here. And that's what he's talking about, okay? This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard from, uh, heard was coming and now is in the world already. So basically, you can't go by what it, how it feels. Oh, that felt like it was the right thing. Or how it sounds. Oh, that sounded good. You have to go by the content of it. Was it good, though? Was it, see, I mean, what do you say there? Um, in, in verse 3, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Well, do you think in every single word given they're going to say, oh, yeah, by the way, Jesus is God, or oh, by the way, Jesus is not God? No, but there's still a character of a word that's given that you can you can discern. All right. See what I mean? Um, <clears throat> so 
Next, we're going to look at a few different things. This is more for if you are the person you think you might have a word from the Lord, you're not sure. Let's look at Jeremiah, who, in my opinion, um, has a lot to say about this. Um, Jeremiah chapter 23, we'll start there, and we'll just kind of hem-haw around Jeremiah. Um, Jeremiah chapter 29, 23, verse 11, says this. Both prophet and priest are ungodly. Even in my house I have found their evil, declares the Lord. So the first thing is, if someone's claiming to be a prophet but living in sin, that's the first thing that discredits their message. Yeah. Because even if it is a word, he didn't say false prophets there, did he? He said both prophet and priest. Uh -huh. Actual prophet and actual priest are ungodly. Right. So that's the first thing. Okay. Now, I'm not talking about people messing up. You know what I mean? Where you're struggling with something. I'm talking about people who are validating their sin, justifying it, living boldly in it. Okay, It's not wrong for me to be a homosexual because I'm free in Christ. You just have to accept that. Living in sin. You can guarantee that the, that, 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 that is not going to be a used prophet, right? right. Okay. Um, verses 13 through 14, a little bit later in the same chapter. In the prophets of Samaria I saw an unsavory thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people as Israel astray. But in the prophets of Jerusalem I have seen a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his evil. All of them have become like Sodom to me and its inhabitants like Gomorrah. So this, these two verses are saying a lot of different things. First off, in verse 13, uh, I saw an unsavory thing. They prophesied by Baal. Is the prophecy something that is by God and for God? Okay, Or is it something by another God? Okay, is it something that's to satisfy our, our flesh, for instance? Okay, or is it something that that all gods are the same? I'm prophesying, I'm prophesying by Allah. So you know what I mean, is it something? And a new age is is really getting into the church world too. So you really gotta watch this because somebody could technically say, "Oh, I have this prophecy from the Lord," and then fi come to find out, "Oh, it's not that Lord; it's a different Lord." Well, which one, Vishnu? Like who are you? Who are you prophesying by? See what I mean? And and I think that that's something that needs to be remembered, guys. The Holy Spirit is not the only one equipping people for prophecy. He's the only one equipping people to true prophecy. The enemy does give audible things, does give prophetic utterances, does give things that even are true, does give things. That do work in people. I'll give you an example, of two different examples. One, Moses in the book of Deuteronomy says this. If they prophesy, even if it does come true, but they they tell you to go worship another god, don't listen to them, kill them, and throw them out of your midst. I'm, te I'm testing you. The second one, pastor, uh, before he got saved, went to a, um, a diviner, palm reader, uh, uh, seer, what are they called? Uh, psychic. psychic, yes. Uh, went to a psychic, and the psychic told him, told him the day that he was going to be saved. She just didn't know what was going to happen. She said, something something's going to happen to you on this day, but she didn't know what. And she was right. It did happen exactly as she said it ha would happen. Don't think that the Holy Spirit is the only one moving through people and, and in people. See what I mean? He's the only spirit of truth working in us for the good of God. Okay? If people go out there looking for things, they're going to find it. The devil is not hiding. He's... he's, he's He's knocking at the door, banging on it, wait, hoping anxiously that you'll that you'll answer for him, and he'll use any little tactic to do it, from things as innocent as TV and cell phones to things as obvious as Ouija boards. He'll use literally anything that, that he can to get his foot in the door. Okay, even a bad attitude. Always, always, always watch your attitudes. But in the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies, so they're doing wrong things. They're, they're living in, in a wrong way. But then, look at this. They strengthen the hands of evildoers. Not only are they doing what's wrong, but they're encouraging other people to do what's wrong. Okay? Now, check this out. So that no one turns from his evil. A true prophet encourages people out of their sin. Doesn't point them back to their sin. And that's exactly what these prophets are doing. They're prophesying all these things... But they're just encouraging people to dwell in their sin more. So that no one turns from his evil. All of them have become like Sodom to me. First off, prophets are supposed to be examples to people. But if you as a prophet are not living separate from how people are living, you are encouraging them. And then, they're not just doing that. They're not just living as a bad example. <clears throat> they're not just living as a bad example. They are then also encouraging them to do the, to the thing themselves. 
See? Yeah. So, a lot of different things happening in these verses. Let's hop down to verse 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesied to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own, own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. Uh, verse 17. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, It shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, No disaster shall come upon you. Well, how do you know that that, that that what this prophet was prophesying wasn't wasn't something to listen to? Because he says there, don't listen to the words of these prophets who prophesy um, about these vain hopes. Well, how do we know that they're prophesying vain, vain hopes? Maybe it is a true thing because of what he says in verse 17. Um, they say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you. They're sugarcoating things for their own gain. Mm -hmm. Okay, They're not telling people what's actually happening. Instead, they're saying, hey, it's going to be well with you even though they're not listening to God. I have a newsflash for you. When you live in rebellion to God, it will not be well with you. God is merciful, so it might be well with you for a, a little bit of time because God's merciful. But then eventually God will start removing removing blessings and he'll start adding on curses. Because that's how God works to try and get our attention gradually and slowly. Anyways. Uh, verse 21 through 22 says, I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them turned them from their evil way and from the uh, evil of their deeds. If you think the Lord is trying to use you in, in, a gift of, uh, in, in, in the gifts, what you need to do is spend more time with them and seek him more to ensure that it's God. See what I mean? And as you seek him, he'll use you. See what I mean? But he's not going to do it in such a... <clears throat> it's like this. When you want to get your finances in order, you want to stop spending your money foolishly, and you pray to the Lord and say, Lord, please help me get my money under control. And you start taking steps to get your money under control. Going to classes, reading books, doing whatever it takes to try and get an understanding of, of, of how you can correct the error. Jesus meets you there, and he... And he helps you to get out of, the, out, of, out of the financial problem that you're in. But did you know that if you don't change anything, Jesus isn't going to meet you on that, and you're not going to find yourself getting out of your financial problems? Mm -hmm. It kind of is the same way with the Holy Spirit with this. If the Holy, the Holy Spirit will start you know, uh, trying to work in you and, you, and you'll feel him drawing you to something, right? But then if you stay off at a distance from the Holy Spirit... He's not going to force you into it. So he's not. You will prophesy. No, he, he's not going to do that. The spirit of the subject is subject. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. He's not going to force you into something. You're not going to go into a trance and. Oh, 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 oh. Now, what about what about when the prophets went into trances? They didn't go into trances. They saw visions. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's different. Paul talks about this. I, I I went up to the third heaven. Whether in body, I don't know. So I mean, he he was in he was in a time with the Lord. And he was taken into the, into the throne, room of, throne room of God, and God met with him there. Okay, He doesn't know if he was actually physically there, if his body disappeared from the earth, or whether his body was there and it was just a vision. He doesn't know. But whatever it was, this is what happened. See what I mean? That's different than saying, oh, you're going to go into a trance. And it, He wasn't being used in the gifts of the Spirit, guys. He was, he was experiencing a vision. It's like when you go to sleep and you dream. Right? right? Uh -huh. And sometimes God does speak to you dreams. I don't want to get into that. Um, Okay, so so the first thing there in 21, I did not send the prophets that they ran. So once again, doesn't necessarily pro doesn't necessarily argue about whether these people are truly prophets or not. He just simply said they they spoke when I when I didn't tell them to speak, and they and they went when I didn't tell them to go. Okay, oh the Lord is calling me to something. Well, how would you know if you're not spending any time to prayer? Right. See, what I mean, be careful when you feel like you're you're being led to all these different things. And you're not in prayer because prayer is our lifeline to God. Think of it as, uh, as a, uh, you know, when you when you get a blood transfusion, think of it as kind of like that. If you don't get that blood transfusion, you're in bad, you're in a bad way. Uh -huh. See what I mean? So just be careful about that. Anyways, uh, and then verse 28, the last verse of this chapter, I want to read. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. Remember that one, okay? Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream. But let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. First thing, faithfully. This is I think that there's two kind of aspects here. For the first half is say the word and exactly the word, as God told you to say the word. Don't don't add stuff to it. But I think the second thing is say it faithfully. Say it when he tells you to, and don't say it when he doesn't tell you to. And I think that this is an encouragement because it got just got done talking about all these false things with the prophets, so that would make it sound like, oh, 
despise prophecies and don't listen to prophets. So he clarifies. Didn't say that at all. Verse 28. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream. I'm not discouraging prophetic things here, guys. But make sure it's the Holy Spirit and not your own wills. Uh -huh. So, um, Deuteronomy 13, 1-3 and 18, 21-22. Um, you know what? I'm not going to turn there. Uh, but if you'd like to write it down and look for yourself later, that's fine. Uh, these are both parts where Moses was talking about uh, prophets. In 18, uh, uh, he's actually talking about the prophet that's going to come after him. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Who is Jesus? But he also gives a qualifier for the, for the for prophets. He says, if they prophesy something and it doesn't come true, don't listen to them. Yeah. But in 13, he says, if I send a pro if if a prophet comes by and they give a prophecy and it comes true, and he says, let us go worship other gods. Don't listen to them. Kill them. I'm testing you to make sure your heart is set after me. Now, so you're saying whether it does happen or whether it doesn't happen, it could still be a false prophet? Yes. Isn't that kind of confusing? Yes. So let's break it down. Let's start with the easier one first, chapter 18. If somebody prophesies this is going to happen and it doesn't happen, easy peasy, well not, that was a false prophecy. Right. But here's the here's the bad news. Can I, can a true prophet give a false prophecy? Yes. Sometimes people get, get confused. Sometimes people think that something is of God. We're, we're going to look at this in Acts, actually. Um, Paul decides to go to Rome. Uh -huh. And all kinds of different prophets keep telling him, Guy, don't go to Rome. You're gonna be you're gonna be arrested, and it, it says very specifically, revealed by the Holy Spirit. Very specifically about all those people who told him these things. Was the Holy Spirit wrong? Wasn't Paul going somewhere? No, the Holy Spirit wasn't wrong at all. The prophets misunderstood because the Holy Spirit revealed to him this is what's going to happen to Paul when he goes to Rome, and so they took it as a oh the Holy Spirit must be telling us to tell Paul not to go. He wasn't telling them to tell Paul not to go. He was just telling them this is what's going to happen when you go. Word of warning. And so Paul answers like this. Why are you trying to break my heart? A am, I am I not going to do this thing to, to, to spread the gospel? Why are, you, why are you grieving me like this? Well, was Paul wrong then? No, nobody was wrong. The prophets just misunderstood what the Holy Spirit was trying to convey to them. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So you can discredit a, a prophecy if it turns out not, not to be true. But here's the thing. If it is, does turn, to be, turns out to be true, do you listen to it? Yes and no. Sometimes a true prophecy will come by a false prophet. Yes, it gets confusing, I know. Okay, but here's the thing. If, <coughs> if the prophet itself, himself does not have a spirit and a heart that's after God to glorify God's kingdom, okay, don't, don't, don't follow after them, don't listen to them, don't be afraid of them. Okay, even if the prophecy does end up coming true. Don't be afraid of them, and, and and this is not someone who needs to be participating in the church. They need to be pushed down, okay? Does that kind of make sense? And this is absolutely essential. There are some things that people need to get kicked out of the church for. This is one of those things. A false prophet who goes in there, stirring people up, and saying un unbiblical things, leading people to another god, that kind of stuff. That's something that needs to be addressed, okay? So any questions on this so far? Okay, First Kings twenty-two five through six. There's a prophet by I mean, there's a, a king by the name of Ahab. He's getting ready to, to to fight, and so he asks his neighbor king. I think his name his name is like Jehoshaphat or something like that. He says, "I need help in uh, fighting this this enemy. Are are you gonna join me on this?" He says, "Okay, yeah, well, sure, right, why not? But but before we do, let's see what the prophets have to say. Just why not? So they gather all these prophets. I think there's four hundred prophets." And they all say, "Oh, go, king! You're you're going to be prosperous." And Jehoshaphat's like, mm, "This seems weird. Do you have any other prophets?" That we and he's like, "Yeah, there's this one guy. <coughs> he never says anything good about me, so I just, you know, I don't really keep him around." And he says, "Okay, let's just let's just ask him. Let's just ask him. See what happens." So Ahab <coughs> sends a messenger to go get this prophet, and the messenger tells him, "Now everybody else there has already told him that things are going to go good, so you should probably do the same too." And the prophet tells the messenger. I'm not going to say anything unless it's God who says it. So he gets there, and Ahab says, should we go and fight this? Are we going to have victory? And the prophet says, oh, go, king. Everything's fine. Go ahead, go. And Ahab knows that he's lying. He says, <coughs> what do I have to do to get you to tell me the truth? Just tell me what's going to happen. He says, you're going to die on the battlefield. And, and then Ahab turns to the other king and says, see? Do you see? He never says anything good about me. And uh, so this, pro uh, this prophet uh, then gives another prophecy, and he says, um, 
there were these spirits in heaven, and they went to God, and God again. God said, "How can I, how can I convince Ahab to go and die in battle?" And and some spirits say this, some say other. Can you get? Uh, some say this, some say these other things, um, and then this one spirit goes to God and he says, "I know how to do it. I'm going to give it and give this deceiving spirit." And so he says, "Okay, go ahead and go." And uh, so then the false prophets say. Oh, okay, hold the phone. Are you? How how did the spirit go from me into you for this to happen? And uh, hey, Ben. Uh, and uh, and uh, they they end up slapping the 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 true prophet, the one true prophet. And uh, and he says, okay, well, you're gonna die too. When this happens, you're you're gonna die, and and you know, that's just what's gonna happen. And so then they, and King and then King Ahab puts the prophet in in, in, in chains basically, and says, okay. Don't let him out until I get home safely. Well, I had never got home safely because just as the Lord said, he died. Mm -hmm. So what do we learn from this? The first thing is prophets are not ruled by money. Pastors talked about this a thousand times on Wednesday nights, and I think it's worth mentioning. Prophets are not ruled by money. They prophesy according to the word of the Lord when the Lord tells them to do, faithfully, not by money. Okay. And all these 400 prophets were on King Ahab's payroll. Mm -hmm. So that goes to tell you something. Okay. Um, so, Numbers 22, uh, 4 through 13 is another story of someone who's not a godly person. There's a, there's a, um, what was the word again with, um, psy, uh, not psychologist, uh, psy, psychic. psychic. There's basically a psychic that's living, uh, all around, the, around the land of Moab, and, uh, it, it goes to great, in fact, I want, I actually am going to read this because I want you to see how they talk to him and how he responds. And then Numbers 22, 4 through 13. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I really want you guys to see just the attitude of what's going on here because this is the attitude of a false prophet. Starting in verse 4. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, This horde will not will now lick up all that is around us. And th these are two kings who are talking, basically kings, don't worry about it, who are talking about uh, Israel who are who's coming in, okay? Um, so Balak, sent, uh, the son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at the time, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, who is the, 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 the seer, at, uh, at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of uh, the people of uh, Amma, to call him, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they are dwelling opposite me. Come now, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. First off, is the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, does he guide us into blessing or into cursing? Blessings, Blessings right? So we can already know that there seems a little something a little bit up here. Right. Second thing is Moab was Moab a righteous nation or an evil nation? Evil. Evil. So we can safely say that this there's also seems something fishy here. Hey buddy. Uh, perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. Notice he specifically attributed uh, Balaam's power to Balaam himself. Okay. Whom you bless is blessed. <coughs> And whom you curse is cursed. And then notice this. Balaam doesn't say anything about it. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the feast for divination in their hand. Once again, what did we say, what did we say about paying prophets for the fees of divination? They were basically paying him to do this, right? Uh -huh. Another sign of a false prophet. And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight. He never once said, It is not by my power that, that I do this, but by God. Remember in Daniel what he says? The, the King Nebuchadnezzar comes to him and says, hey, what does this dream mean? He says, I'm not skilled. However, my God will reveal it to you. Okay? They said specifically, whom you bless will be blessed, whom you curse will be cursed, and he just accepted it. Then look on what he says here. And he said to them, watch here tonight, and I will bring uh, back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So, th so that's probably the only wise thing he does in the whole story. Doesn't give them a straight answer and says, let me pray about it. The only time that, that he does something smart in this whole story. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam, and God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? As if he didn't know, right? And, and, and Balaam said to God, Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent uh, to me, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt, and it covers the face of the earth. Now come and curse them for me, perhaps I shall be able to fight against them and drive them out. He didn't say anything about the whole, Whom you bless will be blessed, and you curse will be cursed. He just left that part out. <laughs> uh, God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Okay, I'm going to stop right there because that's all that's really important. Yeah. God didn't just give him the answer, yes or no. He gave him the reason for his answer. They're blessed, so you shouldn't curse them. Okay. So then 
they end up going back to Balaam, and he says, let me ask God again. Because in the span of that time, they turned from being blessed to being cursed. See what I mean? He wasn't on board with the direction God was leading. The sign of a false prophet. He was for, he was for hire. Mm -hmm. He wasn't on board with, with God's direction. God was directing a people, Israel, to be his holy nation in the land of Canaan. You see, see that? He was doing something. God was working in an, in an area. And the prophet's completely oblivious to it. See what I mean? A true prophet goes with and goes with God's leading. But a false prophet just goes with whatever sounds good. See what I mean? So, uh, 1 Corinthians 12.3 is another thing. Another I'm not going to turn there. You can if you want to. Uh, he's talking about love. And the thing is, he's not just talking about love generally. He's talking about love as it applies to people serving. Okay? Verse 12 is about, uh, is about, I'm sorry, that's verse 13. 13. Yeah. Sorry, it's supposed to be chapter 13, verse 3. You guys can change that on your sheets. It is supposed to be chapter 13. In, in chapter 12, he starts talking about the gifts of the Spirit. In chapter 14, he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit. But in chapter 13, in between, he takes this little bit of a, of a, of a time away to, to talk about how these things have to be done in a spirit of love. Have you ever seen somebody use the gifts of the Spirit without love? I just need to set those people straight. Just tell them how it is. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Yeah. I know you guys, if you've been in church longer, than, been in any church, not our church, but I'm talking about in the church world for longer than five years you've seen this. Mm -hmm. Okay? Some people are, I've got the word of the Lord. And it's like, okay. Yeah. Well, until you have the heart of the Lord, save it, bud. <laughs> uh, and it, so basically what he's talking about in chapter 13, verse 3, he says, this, if, I, if I do all these things, but I don't have love, what is a prophet? And the reason why he says that specifically is because he's talking about, remember, the Corinthian church, two sects are developing, sects are developing in, in, in Corinth. One sect is trying to trying to be the whole monk thing. We're just being separate from the world, separate from all the problems, separate from you sinners. And the other people are trying to indulge in everything. Right. And so obviously there's people misunderstanding the gifts of the Spirit, and they're just kind of overindulging in everything. Everybody's prophesying. Everybody's speaking in tongues. There's no guidance. Everything's just, ah, craziness. Okay? Yeah. And then in all this he says, no, no, no. Not only is it supposed to be for the common good, not for your own good, it's also to be done in a spirit of love. Mm -hmm. So there's another thing is, is, is the thing that you are saying in an attitude of love. I remember one – I'll never forget, forget this. Um, God gave me a word to say. And I had an idea of who it was for, but I wasn't real sure. And so I asked Pastor if I could just say it to the whole church just in case because I didn't want to – I really didn't – I don't like confrontation. And I, It's when I first got started in the gifts of the Spirit, and I didn't really want to leave too much in my comfort zone. You know what I mean? I wanted some familiarity in, in the midst of this really terrifying thing for me. So I, I just did that, and he was like, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead and do it. And it was a very – very big, strong word of warning. Basically, this person, in fact, I can remember it because it was so short. It was, um, you've um, something like uh, been going behind my back or been working behind my back or something like that, um, and now I'm going to expose you in, in public. It was something real harsh like that. I was like, geez. But when I gave it, I was in tears over it because I wasn't in, with an attitude of, oh, that's one of the reasons why I know it was the Holy Spirit because especially if it was a person I thought I thought it was, I couldn't care less if bad went on them. I, you know, I don't like them anyways. See what I mean? But there was just something that came over my heart, and it was like it wasn't – see what I mean? The Holy Spirit did a work in me, gave me the words to say, and told me to go do it. And then he empowered me to do it because I really didn't want to do it. In fact, I remember when my, I was going like this while I was doing it anyways. You see what I mean? Because when the Holy Spirit works, it's not something that's for our glory. See what I mean? This was a very serious word of warning. And I genuinely hope, that if, if it wasn't the person that I'm thinking of, well, obviously, I, I hope that it, if it was the person I'm thinking of, I, I hope it was too, but if it was the person I think it was, they didn't. So I, I genuinely hope that if it was someone else, that they did listen. I genuinely do hope. But I don't know at the end of the day. That, I, I don't know. And that's something you have to be okay with, because prophecies aren't about you knowing or you being right. It has to do with you. God said to do something, so you do it. Uh -huh. See what I mean? So, once again, there's a difference there. If I was giving that message, it would have been something like this. God's going to cut you down. You guys listen to Johnny Cash? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> uh, you see, I mean, I wouldn't just said it like that. Yeah. God, if I could give you some pointers here. That person's kind of a jerk. Let them have it, man. Unleash. Unleash on them. But that's not how the Holy Spirit works. He deals with us in love because he loves us. Right. See? So, um... 
<laughs> so let's look very briefly at the uh, – hold on. Oh, yeah, there's something else I want to mention on this. Um, you'll find that if you're a quiet person, the Holy Spirit will motivate you more to do loud things. I've seen more quiet people being used in gifts of prophecy than I have people who are always talking. Yeah. I don't know how that works, but the Holy Spirit just has a way of 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 using people that he thinks right for the job rather than who we think is right for the job. Now, I'm not saying if you're a loud person, you're a very vocal person, God's not going to use you. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying usually it seems like he, he takes people out of their comfort zone. Can, would you mind grabbing that? I can grab it if you want. It's in my, it's in my uh, pocket in my jacket. Yeah, um, other times he uses this in our weak areas. Yeah, in our weak areas. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, <coughs> another thing is, is the pro person prophesying, if you are the person prophesying, are you seeking God because you want him to be glorified, you want more of him, you want more of him in your life, you want him glorified, or are you seeking answers? And you'll know the difference. God... I don't feel like I'm being used. I don't feel like I feel like my life's just kind of circling the drain. So if you could use me in the gifts of the spirit, that'd be great. <laughs> See what I mean? And we don't say it like that. We say it a lot prettier. But you know, there's that attitude there. Yeah. Where are you in it for God's glory? Well, if if you're saying something prophetically for your own glory, it's better if you just don't, though. See what I mean? Or at least ask the Lord, Lord, please change my heart before I give this, so you can say it with a different attitude, because. I've had God give me a word, and I had the wrong attitude, and so I didn't say it, and as I was in prayer, God would change my heart to give me the right attitude of how to say it. I've had that happen before. See what I mean? Because, remember, the Holy Spirit is the one who's directing, and he does it for, for this is for God's glory, not for our glory. If he wants a message, out, I said, he'll, he'll direct you. So, um, the heart of a prophet, real quick. Um, can you look at 1 Corinthians uh, 13 too? You know what? Go to 1 yeah. Corinthians 12, 3 as well because I want to find out if I uh, meant to put chapter 12 because this is chapter 13 right here. Maybe I maybe I meant to put 12, 3 on that last slide. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 17 uh, says this in verse 15 through 16. It's on another page. Behold, they say to me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come. I have not run away from being your shepherd, nor have I desired the day of sickness. I have obeyed you when you told me to speak, God, and I haven't enjoyed the messages of destruction that you've had me give. It's not like I was waiting and waiting to spew forth death on somebody. That's what he's saying here. I look, no, I haven't desired the day of sickness. I haven't desired for you to pour, pour out your wrath on people. You've told me to tell these people that wrath is coming, but I haven't enjoyed that. But I've also not ran from it either. I did what you told me to do. Um, you know what came out of my lips. It was before your face. I didn't say anything that was of me. You know what I said. You know that I said what I said. What you told me to say. See what I mean? Are you seeing what he's saying here? So then the next thing is, first read 1 Corinthians 12, 3. <clears throat> Therefore I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says... Jesus is a curse, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so I did mean it on that last side. I'm sorry, guys. Where I told you was 13, that switch that back to 12. 12. 12. I'm sorry. This is where I was thinking that I put that um, thing in. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. So go ahead and read 13, too. Okay. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith... So as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Jeremiah 15, 16 through 17. Your words were found and I ate them. Basically what he's saying is I I desired your word. I loved your word. Okay, And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone because your hand was upon me, for you had filled me with indignation. He's saying two things here. The first thing in verse 16, that he was listening to the word of the Lord, and he enjoyed it. It was it was, it was was joy to him, it, it says uh, in ver, in right there, and the delight of my heart. And then in verse 17, he talks about um, how he abstained from not only evil practices, but he also abstained from evil people. I did not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I kept myself from those things. Lord, I set myself apart for your purposes. Okay? 
Um, and then uh, Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 8 through 9, right here. For whenever I speak, I cry aloud, I shout, Violence and destruction, for the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. I gave these messages, but I'm not enjoying this, God. I keep telling people of all this destruction, and all I want to see is Jerusalem restored. Why won't these people just listen to me when, I, when I'm telling them what your word is? If I say, I will not mention him. Or speak any more on his name. I'll just I'll just keep quiet and, and move along and let them do what they're going to do because they're going to do it anyways. There is in my heart as it were a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary with holding it and I cannot. I, I can't keep silent. When you're using the gift, of the, a gift of like for instance prophecy, there's just this, this assurance that you have. And there's, uh, it's often described, it's described as a warm feeling or a twisting in your, in your stomach right about here. Um, and you just have this compelling you, – you have to say it. Yeah. See what I mean? Um, if you're someone who just likes being the center of attention, you like talking all the time, then you might get a little bit of stage fright and mis can confuse it for that. And how you know the distinction is, okay, is it biblical? Is the thing that you're saying, does it match up with the word? And if so, and you're new to it, just take a chance. And worse comes to worse, you tried to serve the Lord and, and you messed up. It's it's better to, 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 to try to say something if God's if you think God's trying to tell you and just mess up than it is to keep your mouth silent if God's telling you to speak. Because you never know if somebody needs that or not. But then as you start being used in the gifts more and more, you just kind of get an idea of it and you start being aware of when it's you and when it's not. But here's the thing. As you're using the gifts of the Spirit more and more, you start getting blind to yourself. In other words... You start kind of making up your own words, and you start believing that they're from the Lord. But you're blind to it, so you don't know that this is happening. So then how do you know how do you know what to do then? Any ideas? Match up with the word again. Okay, there's a good way. Any other, any other idea? That's a good answer. Any other ideas? What? Pray. Okay. I'll win in doubt. Just, just pray. It's okay to, to postpone giving a word. That's okay. Um, maybe ask uh, other leaders' opinions. Well, yes and no. Yes, I, I agree with what you're saying, but sometimes these words are given in the middle of a service. Um, so you really can't, like, flag someone words. down. Oh, so, like, write it down. Well? No, I mean, like... You mean, like, write it down so you don't forget it and then afterwards talk about it. I think about she it. means, like, give the word. Give the word. I mean, like, if you... Oh, go ahead and say it. Because it seems like you're saying, like, you get into a rut where you're starting to give your own words instead uh -huh. of God's words. And if you think you're starting to do that, maybe ask, okay, hey, Pastor, that's the, the last I couple see. times that I've been giving I words, see. what do you think And I think that's right on topic. I think that's, that's right on. Um, and I would also chase that down with... Cause Remember, and we're going to look at this in a second, being subject to people. Well, I'll look at that in just a second. But another thing is, when you're using the gifts of the Spirit, the natural inclination is to become prideful. The natural thing that happens is we can become prideful. If you used at least once a, once a week, it's even greater. If you use more than once a week, it's even greater. Mm -hmm. Okay? And in fact, I'm going to add something onto that. If if you see people used multiple times in a, in any given week in the and in, get in, 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 in gifts, for instance, I I'm used usually at least once a week. Pray for them so that they don't get a big head, so that they don't start spewing out their own nonsense, and that they keep on saying the words of the Lord and not the words of Michael, the words of Randy, the words well, of Sandy. See what I mean? I I think sometimes that people. Maybe the the Lord will use them in that, you know. But then they will intentionally, if the Lord stops using them or that, they'll intentionally keep going at it because they like that yeah. feeling. And also there's this idea that, okay, if the Holy Spirit is withdrawing, I have to up my game so that he'll come back to me. Yeah, I have to yeah. make yeah. it happen. And that's not how the Holy Spirit works. You seek the Lord. If the Holy Spirit tells you to speak, you speak. And if he does not, you don't. Yeah. Right. That's the end of the conversation. Yeah, no. And never under any circumstance says, thus saith the Lord, unless thus said the Lord. Yeah. Never under any circumstance. Okay? There's been times when I – it wasn't a word of it wasn't a word of prophecy or anything. It was just there was something that I, that I was reading in the Word and it stuck out to me. And I just felt like it was encouraging that somebody else needed to know. 
So I would say it. That's not that's not necessarily the Holy Spirit. It, it, that's I was studying and, and this meant something to me. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share with you guys. See what I mean? Right. And you've seen you you guys have seen Lauren do this before. You know what I mean? We'll show like something prepared. We'll, we'll she'll share something like that. It's not that that was a, a gift of prophecy. It was that she had this thing that the Lord shared with her, and so she wanted to share it with you. Does that make sense? And that's happened to me. That's happened to a lot of people. Um, there's something else I was saying though. Um, what else was we talking about before I? Talking about asking the pastor. That oh yes, yes. Thank you. Um, and also on top of that, um, I would say. So stay stay humble. Continue to listen to people, like she said. Seek the Lord even more so if you are being used in the Spirit, in the gifts, than if you aren't being used in the gifts. The Lord starts using you, you need to pray more. You need to seek the Lord more. Because otherwise, you're going to be led astray into all kinds of temptations. As the Holy Spirit uses you, Satan will seek to destroy you. Mm -hmm. Just something that happens. The more God works, the more Satan works. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Whatever. It's just, a, it's just a part of life. Satan's gonna, tr Satan's gonna try and devour you even if you're not doing anything. So right. it's, it's that that old idea: if you don't do anything, Satan will leave you. That's not true no, either. No, no, no. Satan's gonna try and destroy you any any time he can. It's just a bit more that he's gonna. Yeah, and the only thing is, the more you seek God, the the more uh, you'll be equipped for it. So, anyways, um, and also uh, keep in the Word. If you reach a place where you have this idea. I'm just really spiritual. <laughs> I I really have my game together. God's using me. I, you know, my life's really pulling together. Right there, you can guarantee that the words that you're giving are not going to be very authentic. Right. Right when you think you have everything together, that's when you got to watch out. Mm. When we're going through struggles, that's easy because we know we know we need to get our crap together. But when our times are good, man, that's hard. We got to – you know, sometimes it is – I'm going to say it. Sometimes it's harder to be a Christian in America than it is to be a Christian in places where they're being persecuted. Why? Because we allow our spirit to get polluted. A polluted spirit is much harder to take care of than, a, than an abused body, much harder. You can be abused in, in, in flesh where you're being mistreated by people, beaten up and, and stuff like in those countries, and your spirit can have more joy. Than some Christians allow in their life without any persecution. <coughs> Paul says it like this: I've learned to be content in anything, both in riches and in poverty. Why do you think he says that? Because it takes grace from God to be poor, and it takes grace from God to be rich. Mm -hmm. It takes grace from God to deal with persecution physically. And it takes grace from God to deal with the good times. That's hard. It is hard to deal with the good times in such a rich culture. You know, you go to the third world, and it's like, oh man, things are different here. Um, but uh, and also it has to fit with the Holy Spirit. We talked about the whole hundred times. Uh, so some facts about prophecy. First off, prophets don't choose to be prophets. <laughs> God chooses to be prophets. As he wills, he equips. And so when you have people who are self-appointed prophets, don't listen to them. Because what they're going to do is they're going to cause church divisions. They're going to charge church cause church splits and they're going to probably get involved with some kind of stupid nonsense like a house church where they just well that church just wasn't spiritual enough for us the pastor he, he didn't teach me anything I wasn't being fed so I moved on okay Mr. Super Spiritual <laughs> alright but I can guarantee you that the Holy Spirit is not going to use that person even if he did for a time for very long um, you cho you don't choose God, God chooses for you prophets are not for higher fame or feelings well, this feels like a good thing to say. Is it the Holy Spirit or is it not? If it's the Holy Spirit, say it. If it's not the Holy Spirit, then don't. Um, fame. You know, I want people to, to look at me different. I have self-image self, self -image issues. Giving words is not the way to fix that, guys. And in fact, if you give a word and claim for it to be of God and it's not, you're actually going to have more temptation in your life than you would have if you just kept quiet. You're going to feel worse about yourself. You're gonna. It's just bad things, guys. Bad things. Uh, and in fact... I'm not trying to scare people away from being used in the gifts of the Spirit. Paul even says, I hope, I wish that all of you would prophesy. However, I am trying to warn people because there are a lot of people, like what did 1 John just say in chapter 4? Because there's a lot of false prophets out there. So we need to keep in guard. And Paul even says like this, reprimand people in front of the whole church, that way nobody else does it. <laughs> mm. he, I, he, in that part, he wasn't talking about the that. He was talking about with... Um, 
in First Timothy when he's talking about appointing elders and that kind of stuff. But I mean, the principle is still the same. And my point is, you know, the idea of of you know. Don't sweep it under the rug. This person did this. In fact, Paul does that a lot. This person opposed me very vehemently. <laughs> so anyways, uh, and also they're not for hire. You don't prophesy because you were paid to prophesy. You prophesy because either God said prophesy or he didn't. And so you don't. Uh, prophets are equipped by God. The thing that he calls you to do, he will equip you to do. Okay? I'm not very talented with it. Don't worry about it. God, God's got it covered. If he tells you to do something, you just do it. Um, prophets don't always enjoy their calling. That's absolutely true. Don't think that everybody who has a prophetic word or was ever using this prophetic word that they wanted to. It's absolutely true. In fact, Jeremiah complains in many different chapters about, God, can't you just go do something else or go use somebody else or just take me? I wish I hadn't even been born. You know, all these different things. I don't think that he was having too much fun. Um Prophets are not ragers. We, all, we, we like to think of like a nerd rage, you know, where, where, where there's... Um, there's just these these wild people that live out in the desert and they're just always yelling at people. And that's not the heart of a prophet. And that's not <laughs> locusts and wild honey. <laughs> but that's not really what, what prophets are all about. You know, prophets are about trying to bring people back in, into a knowledge of God. Pro uh, pastors are a type of prophet. They pray. They are led by God. They lead the church. That's what a, well, that's what a prophet does. They seek after the Lord and they get sermons that then they give to the congregation. That's what a prophet does. That's what a prophet does. So, um, what are the gifts specifically? Because we looked at them there, and so I want to break them up where you can actually see. Okay, so what what, what does that actually mean? Because if you if if you don't know what an utterance of knowledge is, it makes no difference if, if it's a gift of if it's a gift of the Holy Spirit or not. You don't know what it means. And for, uh, for there could be forty gifts of the spirit, but if you don't know what they are, what they what they mean, then it's like, well, what good is it? Ephesians chapter four, uh, verse eleven through thirteen says this. And uh, if you write in your Bible, mark the underline this one because this is an important one. It says in verse eleven, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. For building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to go through 14. So he gave these different people to equip the saints uh, for, the work. for the work of ministry and for building up the body of Christ. See that? So if something's tearing somebody down, chances are it's not really of God, is it? Right? Because when God speaks through prophets, even if it's harsh words. It's for the purpose of building up. Exactly. Sometimes God has to tear down to build up, and that's when things get a little bit like for Jeremiah, when he had to kick kick the Israelites out of Jerusalem in order to accomplish what he was trying to accomplish. Hopefully it doesn't come to that, but sometimes it does. In fact, he even told Jeremiah three or four, I forgot, I think it's three or four different times, don't pray for them anymore. I'm not going to relent from this disaster. This is going to happen. Nothing's going to change that. Even if the most righteous people in history were to stand before me, it still wouldn't change the facts. This is going to happen. They are going to be conquered, and they are going to be exiled from their homeland. It's going to happen. Stop praying about it. Sometimes things get to that point. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't, though. And so if when, and then, when they do, God sometimes has to destroy in order to build up. Uh, we're, uh, and in fact, sometimes God will destroy so that others won't be destroyed later. See what I mean? Sometimes one person in the church has to be publicly shamed so that somebody else doesn't do it. You know, you know what you do when a, when a pastor uh, gets into sexual immorality or that kind of stuff? They are supposed to be recommended in front of everybody so that other people won't do that. Why? Because in their destruction, others are built up. So it's like a chess game? You just have to weigh the pros and the cons? No. God has his way of how he, how, he, how he leads the church, and he does it for a specific reason. And sometimes he's merciful, and sometimes he carries out wrath. You can't really can't really make God prove himself, but he acts at different times for different things. That's just how he does. Uh, word of knowledge. This is the first in the list. This is a timely spiritual insight, but it is connected with a word of wisdom. Now, Craig Blomberg suggested... 
that if there is a difference between these two things, because he suggested that, that they might just be like two different aspects of the same kind of an idea. You know what I mean? Knowledgeism. And then he said, but if there is, maybe it's more along the lines of um, wisdom is more about how to live morally, insights on how you should how you should conduct an issue like that you're going through, and knowledge might be more about. Um, in fact, if, if you turn to First Corinthians thirteen. He says here, at the very beginning of the, cha of the chapter, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, so that's 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 the gifts of tongues. I don't, we're not we're gonna we're gonna look, move past that. Noisy gong or clanging symbol, uh, clanging symbol. Verse two, and if I have prophetic powers, understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have faith, so as to remove mountains, but I have not. Uh, so it seems to imply that the word of knowledge has to do maybe with with mysteries, revealing things to people, like things in their spirit. You know, hey, I feel like God might be might be uh, might be telling you this. How do you feel about that? Okay, like, hey, Chuck, uh, I feel like God's telling like you confirming some, right, something, right, right, someone. something that that is maybe more spiritual on the inside that that nobody really sees, and maybe wisdom is more like stuff on the outside that people do see, like. Um, I feel like – oh, here, here's an example. Um, one time there was this person who was driving somewhere, and I just felt a check in my spirit. And so I told them, I said, I, I really don't feel good about this. Um, you're driving kind of, it's kind of kind of late at night, and, I, and I'm kind of concerned about this. And so they drove extra careful, and they, they were fine. Now, was it God? I don't know. It could have been. But maybe that's the distinction between a, a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge. The wisdom is more about – things with life and the knowledge is more about things with your spirit maybe it's kind of hard to distinguish because there are two things that are very closely related you know and they're even mentioned right next to each other yeah. you know and I think Paul did that on purpose um, so the next thing um, faith now this is not just it's not a gift of the Holy Spirit to believe in God okay this is this is separate from that faith okay this is a whole other thing. This is – okay, there's a few things. First off, if some, if you're going through a difficult circumstance and the Holy Spirit just fills you with faith in it, you just know that God's in control. See what I mean? I've actually had this happen. We were going through we were going through something, and it seemed like everybody else was discouraged about this thing. And I just – I was praying, and I just felt it in my heart, you know, and, and, that, and that faith stayed with me throughout, throughout the rest of the problem. I didn't worry about it again because it was just this supernatural faith. You know, it, it was something that wasn't of me. It's not like I just willed myself to believe. It's like the Holy Spirit just said, this is how it is. You know what I mean? And, and it's like my spirit just said, okay, cool. You know what I mean? It, it's hard to really explain. But this is a special outpouring. This is not – this is above and beyond your your, your faith and, you know, and the, save, the faith that you were saved by. Okay? Right? That kind of makes sense? So um, usually for a specific circumstance – um, also, in, in, in chapter 13, it kind of contrasts it here in verse 2. It says, uh, um, And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not, have not love. So it seems to imply that maybe the gift of faith also might have something to do with um, working towards a supernatural thing. Maybe, potentially. Because why would he specifically mention, If I have faith so as to remove mountains... So, I mean, he's clearly talking about the gift of faith that he just mentioned in the previous chapter. But as far as what that extends to, it seems like maybe we won't fully understand unless we're in the situation and the Holy Spirit gives us the gift of faith. So, um, then the next one, a gift of healing. This uh, Now, how many of you have, have, you have heard, I have the gift of healing? It's actually gifts of healing. The Greek word is plural. Gifts of healing. Now, there's two possible solutions to why it is plural. The first is that the gift comes, the gifts come and go. Not one person might not have the gifts of healing forever. Okay, yeah, he anointed, he anointed you to heal this person, and then and then he took it away for the next person. Okay, another solution, which is actually the one that it seems to be implying, um, is that there are different gifts of healing for different illnesses. Now, what does that mean? I'm not quite sure, but that seems to be what the text is implying. And we can't make it make a pat. We can't make a verse mean something that we want it to mean simply because we don't understand what it most naturally means. So we could say 
yes, the get the gifts of healing it says gifts because it comes and goes on different people, and I and I do believe that. So I think sometimes uh, you know, some somebody will be using the gift of healing and they'll never be used again. But with that being said, it most naturally reads in the way of different gifts for different illnesses. How does that work? How does that work? A story might help this. Were you going to say something? No. Okay. A story might help. My great-grandpa had a few different kinds of cancers. He had a tumor in his brain and he had, had cancer in his body. And some people prayed for him and he was healed from all that other cancer, but he wasn't healed from the tumor. And he actually died of the brain tumor. The same same great-grandpa that started this church. The reason Torres Community Church is here is because he planted that church. Mm -hmm. So maybe something like that. I don't know. But even though I'm not too sure about what it means, different gifts of healing for different illnesses, like how does that even... I don't know. But, I mean, that's how it most naturally reads, so you guys can read over it yourselves and pray and see if, see if you know, you notice something in the passage that I don't. Because I, I was looking around, I was like, I just don't really get what you're saying here, Paul, but okay. <laughs> Whatever, man. Um, the next one is miracles. Um, this encompasses a lot of different things. Um, things like exorcism, that's a miracle by the power of God. Things like when when, the, when food was multiplied, this is a miracle. Um, but miracles are also closely related with gifts of healing because gifts of healing are also miracles. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> one of those things, huh? Um, so the next, I'm sorry, were you guys still writing? Okay, no? Anybody still writing? I'm just finishing the book. Okay, awesome. Um, so then furthermore, uh, and the next one is prophecy. Now, there are two things about prophecy. People know the first one. Tell the future, right? All right. But prophecy is also not just um, or is it foretelling, but also forthtelling. Did I say that yeah. right? I think I said that right. <clears throat> yeah. Um, where God will give a message to someone. Okay? Um, and or, – or alert them of a sin or encourage them or um, – Something like that. How this is different than uh, utterance of knowledge or wisdom, it seems like there's only a slight difference between the two. I, I'm not quite sure of all the subtleties. Not not fully sure, and I don't I don't want to be that person who claims to know everything about the Holy Spirit because I think there's a lot of foolishness in claiming that you know everything. So I think I'm just going to leave it with that unsureness. And if you have any questions, you can take it to Pastor. You can ask in the question box. You can ask me. We'll see if we can work something out. But uh, I don't think the Holy Spirit was ever intended to be something that we could put our thumb on. Yeah, I completely understand. Um, just like the Trinity, or how can Jesus be fully God and fully man? Yeah, I don't know, man. Whatever. I don't know. Um, see? She doesn't like not knowing either. Um, or when he reveals his will. Uh, sermons, for instance, are, 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 are a prophecy. Uh, spontaneous messages are also a prophecy, like we have after worship in our church. Um, they are subject to scripture. They are not on equal plantation with scripture. Okay? All right? Yeah. Anything that is given in a word is subject to the Bible. If it contradicts, it is not from God. Throw it out. Right. Can one word have a part that is from God and a part that is not from God? Yes. Take the part that is from God. Don't listen to the part that is not from God. Okay? <laughs> Distinguishing of spirits is another. The next one that's mentioned. It seems like, it seems like this is the ability to to tell if something is from God. Not necessarily just with prophecy, because later in chapter um, fourteen he tells people, when somebody's prophesying, let the others listen and discern whether it's from God or not. We don't know if he's saying let the other prophets discern or let the rest of the church discern. He doesn't really clarify, so we don't really know. But it seems like this is something separate from that, because if that's a general thing that everybody's supposed to do, well, then fine. That's not, that's not really a spiritual gift. That's something where you're looking at this, right? right. It doesn't match up with this. It seems like this is something where the Holy Spirit impresses on your heart, that person's not speaking not speaking for me. Or when you hear something, that's not for me. Or, you know, when you're not sure about something in your life and the Holy Spirit just gives you that, that discernment. It seems like it's more in, in line with that. Okay. Um, the next one is is one that is separated, like I said, by the other word for other, heteros. Okay. Speaking in tongues and interpretation. 
Now, we're going to look at this later, but the speaking in tongues in a public setting is profitable. Okay? Let me, let me, let me explain. Paul says it's not profitable for everyone, and that's true. It doesn't validate everyone. It validates you. However, he's not saying that's a bad thing. Okay, He's just saying there's a time and a place for it. On the contrary, he makes it pretty clear that it is a good thing to speak in tongues. But, once again, time and a place. If you're just up there spouting out these, these words, nobody's going to understand you, and you're only edifying yourself. So whereas it, 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 is, it is a benefit to you, it's not a benefit to everybody else. So maybe don't do it in a... Center of attention kind of way. Okay. Also, this gift of speaking in tongues is different than the than the one in Acts two. In Acts two, it says that they were all together in one place. The Holy Spirit was poured out, and He spoke in other tongues that people downstairs understood. This is not that. That was the initial fill, uh, an initial baptism in the Holy Spirit. These people had not had the baptism poured out on them before. And then when it was poured out on them, they spoke in other tongues, as the Spirit allowed, to people who were listening. That's different than this. This is something where the Holy Spirit gifts you to speak in an in a tongue. And it actually might not even be a language. Um, the word used is a general term, and, it, and it's used for more of any vocal utterance. So it could be... I'm obviously you know, trying to bring a humorous side to this. Yeah. You know, Obviously, if you... I have a word from God. Blah, 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 blah. You know, obviously, no, 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 I'm not trying to get off, get off base here. Just no. Um, yeah, just just no. <laughs> uh, but I'm just trying to say, you know, um, we don't know for sure if it's known languages or not. That's my point. Um, and it, it, but it says very specifically that if there's not the next gift of the Spirit, interpreter, just just don't say it in a, in a public setting. You can still still speak in tongues. Just don't do it at that time because it's just going to cause distractions. And when we look at, hopefully we'll look at First Corinthians in the next couple months, and we'll just go through the whole book, verse by verse. I really hope that we do that. And if we do that, we'll work, look at this more then. But um, so this is the gifting for explaining messages in tongues, the previous gift. How do you know if you're speaking in tongues if there's someone who interprets? Yeah. <laughs> it's not that easy. <laughs> A, uh, the Holy Spirit might impress on your heart. Where you just know. B, you might there might be someone there that you, that you just know is used in that thing frequently. Um, <laughs> it's not that easy <laughs> to just. <laughs> so it's one of those things that that, that uh, we'll look at more when we look at First Corinthians. If we look at First, Corinthians. hopefully we'll look at First Corinthians. Um, so, um, and then lastly here on, on this First Corinthians fourteen twelve. Mm -hmm. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Strive to excel in building up the church. And then in uh, 14, uh, 29, and 32, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. So other prophets or other people in the congregation? doesn't really cl clarify. Don't know. However, I do think this is important. Let two or three prophets speak. Why did he put Why did he put a thing on? Hey, no more than two or three, because everybody in the church was trying to prophesy. A church of hundreds of people, they were all trying to prophesy. Usually, they were doing so at the same time. This is terrible. So, in order to curb that, he said, "Okay, just two or three. Let's get this thing under control." Paul is not saying something for all churches here. I don't think so, because uh, I mean, we've had in our church where there's like five or seven given. I think that Paul sees a problem that is developed. And so I think he's giving, once again, what, what I say with the gifts of the Spirit, raining them down to set standards mm -hmm. so that they don't just go off on, on these other different things. Well, and I, I, I think it's more of a um, organization, yeah. Yeah. not just yeah. getting chaotic. Yeah, right. Um, and, yeah, and there's another thing is I think that in, you know, not I think we know that in Corinth there was a lot of competition going on. And I oh, think yeah. there was just a thing of, well, you gave a word, so I'm going to give a word. It is. Uh, just kind of went out of hand. Right. And uh, there's something else I was going to say about that. Especially after you said that, it reminded me of something else. Mm. Anyways. And then in verse 32, and the spirit, uh, spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. In other words, you, you, don't, you don't lose control. You just have to. No, you don't. Um, Some people act like 
the Holy Spirit possesses them. Right, like right, like, like demon possession, Holy Spirit possession. And it's just not a thing that you see. Um, He's just going off. Them. The only exception that is kind of similar to that, besides the whole vision thing, is when you're slaying the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is a time when when the Holy Spirit show let's just say shows up, uh -huh. and it's so intense that it knocks you off your feet. And you just get lost in a place of worship. And literally hours can pass and you just it just you're completely unaware because you're just lost in this place of worship. So slaying the spirit is a thing. I don't think we should seek it. I think that we should seek God and, and if it happens, it happens. Because okay. this was the thing of much anxiety for me in my younger years. Um, I thought that I was going to go into this trance and everything, and I thought that I had to in order to be spiritual, so it was something I was speaking. I wasn't speaking, seeking God's word, God's will. I was seeking to be slain in the Spirit, so I could say that I was slain in the Spirit. For no other reason. So, I mean, and that's just not a good thing. If the Holy Spirit moves for the purpose of building up. So, real quick through these next things. Don't speak aimless or drag on. We're going to look at this maybe in the future, but First Corinthians talks about this. What if I start talking and I just don't really know where I'm going? So then I stop and I start talking... First Corinthians talks about that. Don't do it. Okay? If you have something to say, say it and then stop. Okay? Uh -huh. Move on. In fact, I'll even I'll even see if I can uh, find the verse on it. Um, just so that you can you can keep this in mind because it is it is kind of an important thing. Um, <clears throat> right here. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. Why? Because sometimes people try to monopolize on the gifts of spirit. They get they get using and they just they just want to keep talking because you know, they have no clear direction. So are you saying that there's never a time when you'll start talking and start being using the gifts of spirit and you won't know what you're going to say? No, absolutely, that does happen. You you will be using the gifts of spirit sometimes when um and, and not know what you, what you're saying. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes you, you, you will start to say it and you're just not really, not really sure, but then as you say it, the Holy Spirit just reveals. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where the Holy Spirit gives you something to say. So you say, and then you kind of just get lost. You're like, should I say something else? I don't know. And so you just kind of like him hawing around and maybe add your own stuff in there, and you're just not really wanting to stop and let somebody else have their turn. Right. See you know what I mean? And, the, and 1 Corinthians talks about this to a great extent. Don't let that happen. Okay, because what's going to happen? A, you're going to turn people off the gifts of the Spirit. This person just won't shut up. Right. B, you're going to the Holy Spirit's going to want to use somebody else, and they're going to be too too intimidated to cut you off. Yeah. So they're going to have to listen to you drone on about something that wasn't from God, rather than listen to something that was from God. Right. So understand, there's a balance in these things. When the Holy Spirit says, I'm just saying, when the Holy Spirit tells you to speak, speak. But then when He tells you to stop, stop. Go ahead. I think there can also be an intimidation in that too, in where like, oh, well, I feel like God's only telling me one or two words, but this guy's going on for ten minutes, so right? it must not be real. Yeah, and I do, I'm glad you brought that up. I do want to say that as well. The Holy Spirit doesn't have a word limit on how many words he's going to tell you to give. I've seen somebody say two words. That's it. And it was so obviously from the Holy Spirit. I mean, there was just this conviction instantly when it happened. You know, you could see it instantly touch somebody's heart. You, you can just tell. Right. And then I've seen other people go on for, like, it seems like I'm always shooting my mouth off when I'm giving a word. I hardly ever get short ones. You know, you see what I mean? It seems like some people just get there and just keep going and keep going. And uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't have a word limit. So, um, God uses us in different ways, but doesn't have to give us a certain gift. Some people claim this one's pro this one we can demand the gift of prophecy. We can demand it from God. God is not obligated to do anything. Okay, just back off with that kind of nonsense because that's a good way for the Lord to not use you. Um, so He doesn't have to give us a certain gift, and also God uses us in different ways at different times. And those gifts that we looked at, I I have personally encountered the gift of faith. The gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, the gift of interpretation, myself that I that I have been using, the gift of knowledge and and wisdom. Okay, I have never been using the gifts of healing. I've never been using the gifts gifts of miracles, not once. I was standing right next to, right next to when it was, okay. There's this dude that I knew. He's always he's always had had walking problems because one of his legs is longer than the other one, and so it just offset his hips, and so he's always had problems. Nothing they could really do for him. 
Um, they ha- they were going to give him a surgery, I think, to, to try and, and, and ease the pain on the hip, but there's really nothing they could do. I was there. They were praying for him. I was getting ready to leave, and his leg went like this. Boop! It was the creepiest thing. Okay, like, and, and a pastor told me a story of one time when, when food was multiplied. You know, they kept drawing it out, and they just there's still more, and they just kept drawing it out, and there's still more. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, th- that's really cool. It's just I have never personally been using that. So, um, remember, it's the Holy Spirit who's doing these things. So, seven quick criteria. These are the. This is what I want you to get from the entire lesson. If you didn't get anything else. These are the seven criteria, the things that are most important from this entire lesson. Number one, does it glorify God rather than spe- the speaker, the church, or the denomination? That's the first criteria of being used in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Does it glorify God rather than the person or the place? Okay. Number two, does it accord with Scripture? Do it, is it on track with Scripture or is it its own thing? Because you can guar- be guaranteed if it's not backing up the Holy, the Bible – it is not the Holy Spirit. Number three, does it build up the church? <clears throat> is it is it accomplishing something for God's church? Number four, is it spoken in love? You can have a mean and hateful person who has the word or the word of the Lord. Honestly, God will God can use anybody. Honestly, He can. If He can use me, He can literally use anybody. But here's the thing about that: um, it won't be received. <laughs> it just won't be received in the same way. So, is it spoken in love? Uh, if you're gonna say, if you think you have a word from the Lord and you don't, you're not able to stay in love. It might be better not to say it. Might be. You're gonna have to really let the Lord lead you on that one. But I would encourage you to let the Lord change your heart before you say it. Number five. Does the speaker submit self? Now, write this one in ink on your forehead. Does the speaker submit self to judgment and consensus of others in humility, or do they have this attitude? I have a word of the Lord. What's the attitude? Do they have the attitude of I am submitting myself to the others in the church, that this is that I am claiming that this is a word of the Lord, and I am submitting myself if, if, to, the, to the leadership of the church. I'm not just doing drive-by ministry. Oh, this is what the Lord says. It's it's from the Lord. You can't deny it. Goodbye. Chuck, God is calling you to uh, go ahead throw yourself out of the wheelchair. Diana, God is calling you to quit your job. Whoa, hold on, hold on. It has to be is the speaker has to submit themselves to the judgment and consensus of, of the others with an attitude of humility. Okay, write that one in ink because you're gonna see people uh, people mess up that one, and that one's the probably the easiest one to tell that's not on board. You can, sometimes somebody will say something and you're like that's kind of grayish on the does it back up the Bible or not? That's grayish. I don't want to say it's not God, but mm, you know the whole glorifying God. Oh, I was glorifying God. They can lie about that one. Uh, does it build up the church? That's that's once again iffy. I was I was I was doing it in a roundabout <laughs> way. Okay, whatever. But how do you get out of this one? Yeah. You can't. Uh-huh. If the person's not submitted, you'll know. <laughs> Number six is the speaker in control of their, themselves. Because the Holy Spirit is not going to take control and force you to do something. I just had to. No, you didn't. You didn't have to interrupt the pastor. You didn't have to interrupt this or that and the other thing. Okay? And I want to go back to that passage in 1 Corinthians. Is he saying that you should interrupt somebody giving a word? No. He's talking about when people are monopolizing the time, that person should just let the next person go. Okay? That's what he's talking about. You should let the person finish up with their word before you interrupt, unless it's obvious that God's saying, now this person's dragging on. You have to be real sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Because remember, we are not being led by our own passions and desires. We are being led by what the Holy Spirit wants. Sorry this is going so long, guys. The seventh criteria, is there reasonable whoop, um, Is there reasonable instruction or excessive detail? Was it something that, wait, what? Or was it something that, like, you're really beating this dead horse. Like, we get it. We can move on now. Mm-hmm. See what I mean? These are the seven criteria of whether you should speak or not. Run it through this quick list, and you'll know. Is it from the Lord? Even if it's not, and you're genuinely seeking, you won't do that but once or twice, and then the Holy Spirit will, will confirm in you, and he'll, he'll work through you. You only accidentally give a wrong word once or twice, honestly. Most three or four times. But after that, you'll kind of get used to it. You'll kind of get an idea of what, and God will kind of, you know, use you and show you. It's when you're purposely doing things or you've gotten so prideful that you don't even see it anymore. So the question of the week, how do you know uh, you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit? How do you know? Good question. Um, and, and also, uh, another question to think, you know, and this isn't the question of the week, but just something to think about. 
can you be using the gifts of the Spirit without being baptized in the Holy Spirit? Think about these things. Okay? Think about them. And uh, we'll pick up next week with that. Any questions before we stop? I genuinely hope not because I went way too long anyways. <laughs> no questions? I just had one comment. Go ahead. Um, I, I don't know if you mentioned this or not. Um, I know in one of the courses that I was taking, it was talking about the gifts of the Spirit and that, and it said, don't seek the gift for the gift. Yeah. Make sure you're seeking it for God to be glorified yeah. and to build up the church. Yeah. Because that's the purpose of them. Yeah. But a lot of times we see other people used and we're like, oh, I want that. But we just want that. Well, for, I want that. For, for our glory. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. So. Good comments.